introduce it myself, and I will be your moderator today. We're going to start in about two more minutes to give others a chance to sign on. Good afternoon again. My name is Karen Handmaker. I'm the VP of Population Health Strategies at Vitel, and I will be your moderator. Welcome to this webinar. Before we start, I want to ensure that everyone is familiar with the webinar control panel. First, we hope you can all see the control panel on the right side of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel by clicking on the arrow button in the upper left-hand corner of the, of the panel. Second, you can submit questions using the question section located in the middle of the panel by clicking on the question button and entering your question. We really hope you will ask questions um, so that we can answer them at the end of the presentation. If your question was not answered, we will respond to you individually after the webinar. And in addition, all registrants will receive a copy of the presentation as well as, as the recording. I will now introduce our speaker. Dr. Amit Rastogi is President and CEO of PriMed, a 100-provider multi-specialty integrated medical group with 20 locations throughout Fairfield County, Connecticut that serves more than 120,000 patients annually. Dr. Rastogi earned his medical degree from UMDNJ New Jersey Medical School, Newark, New Jersey. He is board certified in internal medicine. He has been in private practice in Bridgeport, Connecticut since 1998. Dr. Rastogi's executive appointments include PriMed LLC President, Executive Committee President, PriMed Management Committee, Past Secretary and Treasurer of the Executive Committee, Past Chairperson of the PriMed Finance Committee, and Past Medical Director of the PriMed Osteoporosis Center. Dr. Rastogi plays a key role in growing the network of physicians with strategic growth operations, patient outreach strategies, and technology. We are very pleased to have Dr. Rastogi to talk to you today about value-based healthcare, the innovator's dilemma. Dr. Rastogi? Listen, uh, thanks very much, first of all, for that flattering info, uh, intro. I'm, I'm definitely going to have you uh, read that out to my mother later on, so she'll be impressed by <laughs> what, what, what she thinks I've accomplished. Um, and then I want to thank everybody in the audience for taking the time out today to uh, uh, join us and, 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 and uh, give us the opportunity to talk a little bit about value-based health care and, and, and where we think some of the opportunities are. Uh, first, just to give you an example of, of why we call this talk the innovator's dilemma. So, you know, in medicine for the past many, many, many decades, all you had to do was open up an office after you finish your residency, you know, put your name on a shingle, the patient would still slowly start to trickle in. After a couple of years, you'd have a great panel and you could practice 30, 40 years without any hiccups. But the reality of it is that the blue chip, which is medicine, has actually changed pretty drastically, literally within the past five or six years. Um, Clay Christensen, who is, is a Harvard Business School professor and, and one of my favorite authors, uh, wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma and the Innovator's Solution after that. 
you know, probably about, I think about 10 years or so ago, and, and what he talked about in that book was, if you have a successful business model that's working today, and, and in those days he was talking more about technology firms, how do you keep your current success going, but at the same time continue to innovate so you don't become obsolete? Um, the reality is most of us in medicine are starting to realize we're faced with the same dilemma. So even if you have a successful practice, a successful hospital system today, if you don't continue to innovate because of all the changes going around, you actually do risk becoming obsolete or you know, risk losing much of your market share to somebody else in the community who can actually move ahead you know, faster than you. So for us, where's the innovation? It's really about going towards value-based healthcare. You know, even though in the past we, we, we've had um, opportunities such as capitation, you know, fee-for-service, with all those changes, the one thing that we've come to realize is that because of the economic forces, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, that are upon us, you know, just about everybody will tell you that regardless of what happens to the Affordable Care Act and everything else, and no matter what happens with the political climate, value-based health care is definitely here to stay. So we're going to touch uh, upon four things today. You know, one is why is value-based health care happening? How is it changing the healthcare delivery landscape? What can any of us do to meet these challenges? And then number four, what are the tools that we really need to move ahead? And that's what a lot of the innovation is about too. It's not just about what we can do a little bit differently with, with patients or patient care. It's also about using technology to try to improve our productivity as well. So first, let's start off with why it's happening. So what, much of what's changed over the past couple of years and what we see changing over the next five to 10 years it's not just that costs are going up and reimbursements are going down. There's actually a few very dramatic shifts that are happening. Um, with regards to reimbursement, not, not only is there just cost-based risk, if we look at the top left box, there's also going to be a risk based on quality going forward too. And this is happening both on, on the, the public payer side and also on the commercial payer side as well. Obviously, continuing cost pressures on, on, as we move towards the right. And lost, let's talk a little bit about why that's happening. So. One of the biggest changes I think we're all aware of is the, is the change in the case mix that's happening. As the, as the population ages, certainly across the U.S. and across the globe as well, a lot of the profitable, easy procedures that were out there are different because most of the folks have chronic conditions and, and, and many, many comorbidities. The incident of chronic disease and multiple comorbidities only going to rise as the population continues to age. And then finally, as we look at, at the bottom left, the other big change that we're seeing and again, this is a byproduct of the population aging, is that the payer mix is shifting, um, you know, going from mostly towards a, uh, a public payer mix, you know, going forward. So why is that a challenge? You know, if, if we take a look at what the, what the projections are with, with, with regards to what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act, we know that on the public payer side, there's definitely going to be challenges with regards to reimbursement. What kind of makes that further adding to that challenge is in the past, you know, most of us on the provider side used to be able to count on uh, you know, having patients uh, insured by the commercial payers, which would actually help us offset some of the lower reimbursements that may have been there on, on the public payer side. But as we're seeing most of the projections that are coming out because of what's happening in terms of the business cycle and, again, the aging population, it looks like even on the commercial payer side, we're going to be challenged with regards to reimbursements over the next five to ten years. This is actually an interesting um, you know, cover that was on the on, on medical economics, uh, you know, late last summer, which said that, well, you know, maybe this is the end of fee for service. The reality of it is that even though fee for service is not, in, in my opinion, is not going to go away completely, it is going to be drastically changing going forward. So let's move on to our next uh, leg of our journey, which is how is this changing the healthcare delivery landscape? So this slide is from three years ago, and the reason that I choose to keep this slide in here is. It gives us an idea of how much has changed just literally in just about three years. So this slide from July 2011 gives us an example of any of the commercial payers that were looking or starting to embark upon ACO type of products. And you can see that there's literally just about four that are on the screen here at that time. If we had this slide for today that could be redone, what we would find is there are probably four in just about every state, not just four in the nation. That's how quickly the, the value-based uh, uh, movement is moving forward. Part of the reason that, that, that it's moving forward is what we've already started to see is that the health systems and the medical groups that are able to execute well on value-based patient-centered care and on population health management, they are starting to show that, that they can provide higher quality care and lower cost at the same time. 
and that's why this, this uh, movement is gaining so much momentum very, very quickly. Some of the other things that we're seeing in, in nationally across the marketplace is the, the emergence of new partnerships. A lot of times folks are looking at innovative relationships with retail pharmacies in terms of education and, and even product dis dispensation. Large employers, again, to try to maneuver their cost profile are also having direct partnerships with pharmacies and, and many types of providers as well. So most of us on the provider side not only provide care, we're also employers as well. And we, we kind of feel also the brunt that everybody else on the employer side feels out in the nation that um, the costs continue to increase as we look to provide uh, affordable health care to our employees. Um, IBM recently, uh, I think about six or so months ago, uh, made a pretty drastic change, especially for Blue Chip Company, about how they were going to be treating um, you know, their employees who prior to, you know, had been on the health plans. Even though currently 80 to 90 percent of, of employees are still covered uh, by the employer, we're definitely seeing a much, much greater shift across the nation. The, the trend in a very, very significant way over the last three years has definitely moved towards, especially on, on, even on the commercial side, towards more consumer-directed health plans where the, the employee or, or, the, or the consumer, if you will, will actually be responsible for, 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 for a big bulk of the cost, especially initially. So where does this help the employer? Not only does it help them cut costs, quite frankly, they also get out of the administration business. And that's why we're seeing a higher and higher number of folks looking toward the exchanges especially on the employer side as time goes on. One of the, the big changes that, that we've seen you know, from the past where employers only looked for just you know, cost value and just for uh, uh, you know, wellness programs, now even employers are starting to see that a lot of, of where they can have cost savings is by trying to manage some of the, the sickest patients. So now, again, uh, the employers not only are they offering wellness programs, they're also looking at high-touch programs for, for, for any of their employees who may have diabetes, COPD, coronary artery disease. And again, they're realizing that in the end, what we really have to do to be able to control costs, even from an employer side, uh, not just a provider side, is to be able to manage chronic conditions well. So as, as a corollary to that, which was an experiment many, many years ago, now is proliferating very, very quickly are, you know, what do you call it, an accountable care organization, patient-centered medical home. But again, these are all just different iterations of value-based health care, which, again, in order to control costs, definitely is becoming the wave, certainly, of the present, if, if, if not, you know, for the future as well. So we've talked about a little bit about you know, why it's happening and how it's affecting everything around this. And let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what we as providers can, can, can do to kind of meet these challenges. I think there, there are two very, very important tenets to this. One is we have to truly look at our organizations, again, you know, whether it's a, a large health system or a medical group, and, and really evaluate our own strengths and weaknesses. And you have to be able to look in the mirror and be honest about it because you can't think you're great, get into a risk contract, and then find out the hard way that you're not. Number two, going forward, the silo approach for delivering medical care is absolutely not going to work. We definitely have to look at collaborative relationships. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So here's a survey of, of some healthcare providers showing that, you know, who wants to uh, pursue risk, we're looking at population health models and collaborative care ACOs. Like I said, I think that the first step before looking at what you think you want your organization to morph into is, is really doing a, a deep analysis of what your core competencies are. Are you able to take risk? Do you have the information technology to, to support it? How, is, is your clinical network truly integrated, those are questions that you really have to do a deep dive into before you can really jump into taking on any types of risk or risk type of agreements. Number two, building relationships. Again, it's going to be impossible, again, if you're a medical group or a hospital just to stay on your own. You really have to look at everything else out in your community because you're not going to be able to do population health if, if we don't look at care across a continuum. So here's a, a quote from Morty Hansen, and, and, and many of us know him from good to great and, and great by choice, and I had a chance to uh, meet him a couple of years ago. And I always think about the thing that he said, which was, you know, seek to, seek not to collaborate, but seek to create value. And, and the reason that really resonated with me was, as we look at the wave of consolidation across the country, one of the biggest mistakes I think that many healthcare systems or providers are making is teaming up with somebody just for the sake of either gaining size or teaming up without actually looking at does that relationship actually provide value. Because if you don't look at it that way, then as time goes on, you feel you're going to find that if there's no true synergies there, all you've done is compound your problems. 
So let, let's go further on and talk a little bit about more we can do about meeting these challenges. So one of the things that I'll tell you that does not change is that you need to be able to control the patient flow. Now, in the traditional fee-for-service model, many providers wanted to control the, 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 the flow of the patients in order to be able to you know, capture the, the, the revenue, to be able to capture the patient flow. As you move towards value-based purchasing and population cost and quality risk, what we find is that if you don't uh, control the patient flow, there's no way for you to be able to improve the care coordination. There's no way to be able to reduce unnecessary utilization because what's going to happen is if they go out of your network, you're not going to have any control at all over their quality or their cost. So that, that premise definitely has not changed. So the biggest challenge that I feel for any of us who are in, in, in medical organizations is really changing the culture because we've I mean, many of us have thrived very well in, in, in the fee-for-service world. As we try to con you know, look at our teams and say, boy, you know, we, we really need to kind of burn our ships and move forward, we really have to be able to get the buy-in and the culture change. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to accomplish what we need to in a bigger scale if we don't accomplish what we need to at the point of care. Part of what that strategy is is trying to be able to convince um, you know, the providers that look, you know, going forward, we're going to have to change our compensation models. Now, granted, none of those things are easy. Uh, if we look at the past, it, it's been more um, you know, kind of RVU-based or productivity-based. But as we look forward, really the principles are going to be around managing network and panel size, um, adherence to care protocols, patient outcomes, patient satisfaction. And that's really with the, the way that, that even the compensation within, within organization need to go to be able to cr truly kind of align incentives. Now, if you have a group that's been around for 20 years, you're not going to be able to convince your, your providers to do that from day one. You really need probably about a three to five year strategy where the first year you say, listen, you're not know, going to change compensator strategies, and then you really don't change them at all. But then the next year you start changing it slowly. What you'll find is that after you change them slowly, when some of the docs do better than the docs, Initially, they'll complain about it. Then everybody's going to want to know, how do I get to do as well as the other doc is doing? And you'd be surprised at how well that, that really moves behavior forward. Now, when we look at the categories that, 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 that you need to really focus on, there's really five that I think are, are universally the, the, the best accepted to be able to, A, reward the right behavior and, 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 and reward the folks who are doing the right thing, but B, also to drive change. Obviously, you know, clinical quality has, has to be the first tenet. If you're not going to provide quality care, it doesn't really matter um, how much cost savings you've had. Um, just for the folks, I'm, I'm sure you know, most of the folks on, on, on the, on, in the audience know, that's how uh, Medicare's CMS uh, um, ACO guidelines go as well. So if you're an ACO, even if you save the money in your shared savings program, you actually don't qualify for any savings if you didn't you know, meet the quality metrics as well. Number two, patient satisfaction. I think we've all realized that, that gone are the days when you can have the patient waiting out there for three hours, and rightfully so. Now we really are trying to provide patient-centered care, and part of the part of that is is is, is you know respecting the patient and making sure that we're providing them you know care in a way that that makes them feel that you really care about them. Number three, access. Uh, again, you know, gone are the days when you can call your doctor's office and they tell you, you know, um, uh, that you, you call them and you say you're sick and they'll tell you, well, I can see you in two weeks, which by the time either you've gotten well or you've gotten a lot worse. But I think the reality is that we all know that you have to provide same-day access. And I think if we, bring, if we build compensation bonuses around that, it really gives our provider the incentives to follow that. Uh, teamwork and citizenship, again, um, I've said this in my talk and I'll continue to say it over and over again is that there's no, no one who, who can you know, prosper in a new world in a silo. We definitely have to kind of work together. And then obviously expense reduction because uh, the, the, the pie, unfortunately, is a zero-sum game. If we don't look to create efficiencies, you're only going to reduce expenses by cutting care, which nobody really wants to, and quite frankly, I don't think really has to be done. I think that ex, you know, expense reduction can easily be done in a very ethical and, and, and a good manner by literally just improving efficiencies. So. Along those lines, the, the, the physicians and the providers really need to be at, at, at the center. So whether it's looking at utilization management, expense management, and clinical outcomes, and I think the, the movement across the country really does, does recognize that, that without the, the physicians and the caregivers at the, at the center and kind of having a seat at the table, it's going to be impossible to really move this movement along. So let's talk a little bit about what are the tools that we need, because this is very important, right? So. I, I, I heard a very interesting fact from, from uh, you know, one of the big consulting companies 
about a year ago, which I thought was very impactful, that if you look at just about every industry across the nation, they've seen a pretty significant productivity increase over the past couple of, of decades because of, uh, of, of improvement in technology and the use of technology. Now, medicine, despite the EMR and everything else, has actually seen zero improvement in, in productivity literally over the past 15 years or so. So that's exactly what I was getting to earlier, is that if we use technology and we use it well, we really have a lot of opportunity to be able to improve our productivity, which means that, again, as we use utilization management and expense reduction, we can use technology and other tools to help us, not necessarily meaning that we have to get on a treadmill and just try to see more and more patients. Um, when we talk about information technology, it really encompasses a few different aspects. Obviously, the, the electronic health record is there. Most of us who use electronic health records find that even though you know it, it's advanced some, it's still a little more than just a electronic notebook right now. It's only when we combine that with other providers where we can have access to the information and start using data analytics um, and referral management tools where it actually starts to realize its, its potential and, and what it was supposed to be it was supposed to mean as you start to communicate with, with everyone else on the team. So let's talk a little bit about the team as. One of the things that we realize is that when you have technology, and for most of us as physicians, I know myself, I'll be the first to admit, uh, you know, I, I love technology, I, I use it, I have, a very, I have a voracious appetite for it, but if you ask me to fix anything, I have no idea what I'm doing. You really need to have the support behind the technology as well, and depending on your size and the scope of your organization, sometimes that, that may mean that you have local folks on staff, sometimes that may mean that you, you have a um, an outsourcing mechanism or a centralized mechanism that can help you with that. But you definitely need to have that there. Because again, if you're going to move forward in, into value-based healthcare, you need to have disease registries, data analysis, and again, without having a sophisticated support staff, none of us are really going to be able to figure out what to do with that data, and B, how do we improve what we're doing if we don't know how to analyze the data and then project it and give it to our, our, our providers as well. So here's a interesting article from the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, which was again, you know, pretty surprising to see that overall, if you look at some of the most common diagnoses, including you know, atrial fibrillation, diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, asthma, uh, asthma, osteoarthritis, CHF, most of the conditions which we literally see every day in primary care, that that the compliance rates are literally at about 45 percent, and this is despite our best efforts. But part of that is that as physicians, there's only so much we're able to do just in, in, in you know the one visit every couple of months that we see them. Um, part of the move going forward in terms of uh, utilization and, 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 and trying to improve quality of care is also using evidence-based guidelines. Um, you know, and, and obviously, the most common diagnosis that we look at are things like diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure. But the reality of it is that those can be developed just for, for about any of the common diagnoses with the, which, which occur with any of the specialties. Now, in PrimeMed, we've actually been using outreach probably for close to a decade in our practice, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's been a great boon for us. When we look at our um, uh, screening rates for, let's take an example, like colorectal uh, cancer, and nationally, the, the averages are, are for colorectal screening are, uh, are, are at about in the, in the low to mid 50s percent for, for, for folks who want to become eligible. In PrimeMed, we're actually in the mid to high 80s percent. And a lot of that is because we use a lot of automation to remind folks when to do for their colonoscopy. Same thing for our diabetics when to do for their visits, um, you know, coronary disease, and even for people when they do for our wellness visits. So when we, when we look back at why our, a lot of our population health metrics in terms of our, our quality and our cost efficiency and everything looks so good and, and how we're able to keep out of the hospital, a lot of that's because we've used outreach very, very successfully over, over the last um, like said, eight to ten years or so. Um, and I was mentioning it varies year by year depending on what we find when we do our own internal data analysis. There's some years when we use the, the, the preventive outreach more, other years, other years when we use the chronic outreach more. But again, as you can see, the, the, the trend has definitely been increasing over the last couple of years. So this is an example of just you know one year snapshot where we identified you know, folks, uh, patients with different diagnoses who uh, were not able to make it to the office and we, we thought there were some gaps in care. And um, as you can see from the slide in front of you, there were nearly 50,000 patients that we identified. Uh, out of that, we had a 91.6 successful contact uh, uh, ratio. 
and then you know, confirmed visit response rate 33 percent so you can see there's quite a few folks who really needed to come in who if we had not used outreach we would not have had the opportunity to see them and then oftentimes what happens with those folks is as they end up being uncontrolled and again it's not a matter of even patient fault not that they want to come in we all get busy with our lives if we hadn't used outreach to have them come in a lot of times the next time you see them is in the emergency room when either their diabetes is out of control or they're having issues with their blood pressure um, so on and so forth so you know we are definitely strong believers in in the value of outreach so as, as we move towards NCQA accreditation you look at most of the metrics that need to be met a lot of the, the metrics are impossible to meet if you don't have those folks come in on regular schedules and you can provide the data and again without outreach to do that manually is is a, is a impossible task and, and to be honest with you even from a, a resource standpoint a very very inefficient one so before we open this up to, to questions I just want to you know give a bit of a summary here so value-based healthcare both from the commercial side from the employer side and, and, and certainly from from the government payer side, it's definitely gaining momentum and, and, and I feel it's definitely here to stay at least for the next decade or so. All of us are going to be accountable for cost and quality and, and the, obviously what that means by accountable is we're actually going to have to show what we're doing. Now, if we don't gather our own data, then somebody else will be gathering data and we'll be at their mercy for whatever they see the results are, even if we feel it's an inaccurate. And that's why I strongly feel it's important for all of us to gather our own data. Uh, number two, organizations need to evolve quickly. And this is what I started out to talk with, which is the innovator's dilemma. We, we don't have five years, eight years anymore to do it. Um, I, I always surprise the board members of our group by having meetings more and more frequently and just telling them that, listen, you know, stuff we did six months ago and now we've got to change course again. But that's just the reality of the world. Medicine has become just like everything else. It used to be, like I said, a blue chip stock. Nothing changed very much for a long time. But now, if, if we're not able to evolve, we really face extinction, you know, for that particular group of health system very, very quickly. Um, yeah, but, but, the, but, you know, getting to the heart of that, you have to really evolve the culture of the organization to say, look, you know, one thing that's definitely going to be constant is that change is going to be a constant. And the quicker you, you get your own providers and everybody in the organization around that, then the easier it is every time you tell them that we have to make some tweaks in our course, that, listen, we had a strategy six months or a year ago, because of these things that are changed in the community or in the environment or in the legislation, we need to, again, change our strategy and, 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 and change directions a little bit. And then finally, and I can't uh, talk about this one enough, is really collaborate and create value. You definitely have to have partnerships. Look at your partners carefully. Do a business plan to see, well, how does this add value to me? How does this collaborate? Because I don't believe that size, just for the, having, for the heck of having size going forward, is, is going to be the way to go. And then finally, information technology. I think this is probably what's lacking the most, um, especially in, in a lot of our, our doctor's offices, is really using the information technology that can help us be more productive. So Peter Drucker, who is the guru of management, talks a little bit about, uh, is always talking about change in business. And as I mentioned earlier, medicine has become no, you know, no difference. And, and, and you know, one of the things I love about this quote from Peter is it talks about not only just that, you know, in, in turbulent times, and which is what medicine has become nowadays, it's not the turbulence that's a problem. It's, it's the fact that if, if, if we all can say, listen, you know, I know what it worked for me 30 years ago, that's going to work for me today. That really isn't true. We have to apply today's logic to, to, to what we wanted to go forward. And then, you know, finally, I, I'm always, I've been a big basketball fan. I have never been a fan of any team as, as big as I was of, of the Chicago Bulls from, from the days of when Michael Jordan was there because what was great was you realized as good as Michael was and everything that he great did you needed Scotty Pippen and Pippen and you needed uh, Dennis Rodman the, even though he had a different color hair every time he had his job and he did it well and it spoke to really the teamwork that, that was needed to be there so I've tried to cover a lot of ground because I wanted to also leave some time for questions and answers so we're going to open that up and please submit your questions uh, via the question section at this time and then we can move forward with that. Thank you, Dr. Ristogi. That was just excellent and the questions are starting to come in. Uh, the, the first question is tied to um, your slides on, um, on physician compensation and how you're modifying that model. 
Sure. Do you distribute shared savings per capita or based on um, relative scores or improvement over time? How are you how are you phasing that in for physicians? So so what we're doing is we're we're looking at the, the, those five metrics that I talked about, which was um, you know uh, clinical quality, patient satisfaction, you know, teamwork. So we, we we spread it across those five metrics, and what we do is. We, we're, we're actually in the midst of doing this right now, renewing this for the summer when our next cycle starts and saying, okay, th these are the amount of dollars that we're going to set aside. We give them a range that lets you end patient satisfaction. Those who score below, let's say, 90% will be not eligible for anything. Those are, who, are, uh, who score above 95% will, will be eligible for X amount of, of dollars and then so on and so forth. And, and then for the quality metrics, we did the same thing, um, access, panel size, Literally what we do is we carve out different categories and we try to keep it very, very simple. So there'll be literally three tranches within any of those categories. And um, we, we, we really don't want to do it on a per capita basis. And the reason we don't do it on a per capita basis is because the physicians are, you know, all of us are still compensated in the fee-for-service model as far as their per capita goes. So we feel that any of the savings and any bonuses really should reward the right behavior because the fee-for-service part is already being taken care of. Thank you. Um, another question came in about teamwork and citizenship, um, where the, the um, question is, how can we educate and engage providers to assist patients in seeking treatment or other social services that would improve their health? Because as you know, as a physician and from the patients you treat, that um, life circumstances often um, get in the way. Um, maybe in addition, we could you could talk about how you utilize the health coaches that you mentioned. Sure, sure. So you know, I, I think a lot of it uh, goes into the the, the the doctor and patient relationship. So uh, I'll tell you one thing that that we try to do is let's say when we have diabetics or congestive heart failure, really have them access the nutritionist because what we found is is that the folks who also access the nutritionists are the ones le least likely to be uncontrolled for their diabetes and on the CHF side are the ones least likely to end up in the hospital because they had a, a big salt meal. And to be honest with you, I think that, that the biggest is repetition. It's just about seeing it over and over again. Some people you still won't be able to, to convince. The other challenge that we face is, is that unfortunately some of those services um, you know, are, are not covered for the patients. So what we do as a big group is a lot of those we just write off as a cost. Um, I know not everybody has the ability to be able to do that, but we see that as an investment in, in, in value-based health care where some of those services we're able to um, you know, provide for free. But, but that is unfortunately a challenge where if, if, if there's, you know, whether it's provider systems are not able to do that and it becomes a patient cost, patients a lot of times, um, because it's also not covered by their insurance, will not end up wanting to spend money for, for an office visit with the nutritionist or, 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 with, or with the health coach. But like I said, I think that if you make it fun for them in terms of hiring, hiring the right person and, and, and be able to try to provide some type of a financial cushion for it, I think that the compliance with that you know, goes up pretty significantly. Thank you. Another question. Um, has NCQA PCMH recognition been part of your strategy to move toward value-based care? And um, in addition, are any of the payers providing additional reimbursement to support your PCMH strategy? So, you know, it, it's something that we've definitely been rolling out um, over the past year or so, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll have, um, we have NCQA certification for diabetes and some other diagnoses, and we're moving towards the PCMH model as well. Um, you know, for us, the reason we haven't been as aggressive about it in the past was because, again, as, as a group that's been around for nearly 20 years, the, 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 the core competencies of what PCMH requires is the way we've been practicing anyway. Um, but as we move forward, we're definitely going to move uh, closer and closer towards certification. As far as the reimbursement goes, uh, you know, at least up until now, we haven't seen anything that's, let's put it this way, significant enough to really make a difference. Uh, you know, as, as we move towards that, you know, I think that things are going to continue to change more and more in the next couple of years. And I'll tell you why I think that, because what happens is that if you look at most of the, the insurers or even employers, since they have no real way of being able to evaluate your data or, or to say um, whether you're uh, you know, of a certain level because they don't want to just take your word for it, they will be looking to many of these certification type of agencies. And that's why I think that if you're an ACO, that then, then employers or insurers will know that you're providing care in a certain way and you've met CMS 
metrics for that. I think the same thing is going to happen with NCQA and, and, and PCMH going forward as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, another question on data tracking. How, how do you track your performance on the quality measures for your value-based contracts? So, so what happens is, is we'll, uh, you know, we'll be, we have a data analytics program, and then we have data, we have data analysts on staff. This is what I was getting to earlier. So, you know, we tell them that look, you know, what we want to obviously uh, on the CMS because we are an AC accountable care organization as well. The CMS guidelines would they work on those, but we may have other metrics that we may want to just track independently, just because we think that they're important for quality of care. We may just let's say, you know, want to focus on um, hemoglobin A1Cs, LDL. Um, you know, uh, um, and hypertension. Now, before we had data analytics, we actually uh, just used to use our own data warehouse just to look at those top five common diagnoses, and then we would give give the report cards to our physicians, and they would be able to see, uh, well, how many of their diabetics are well controlled, how many of their LDL goals are met, and we would actually also benchmark them against the other doctors in the group, and even try to show them national benchmarks too, to really try to imp uh, drive improvement in behavior. And that leads, that leads to a, a question that we got about um, what systems you use to um, for your data analysis. Are they internal or external? Uh, they're external. So you know, for for the outreach, we use you know we use the the Fitel for our EMR. We have Integrate, and then for the data analytics, we use uh, Wellfentive. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, other question came in about. Um, your care teams, and you know, are you using um, any physician extenders like nurse practitioners and physician assistants and others who can also um, uh, help to manage populations and, and patients with chronic care? So I, I think that that's a great question. One of the things that I always preach is that I think that um, going forward, again, from an improving productivity standpoint, in addition to technology, most offices must move towards move where, where a team care approach where you have a physician and then you have one or two extenders working with each physician because so I'll give you an example but when we have folks let's say who get discharged from the hospital um, once they get discharged from the hospital they have a care coordinator uh, that we have as part of our ACO who helps them make an appointment in the office make sure that they're seen within the first you know three to five days depending on the severity of their illness they'll, they'll have an appointment with the APRN the APRN will gather all the data, examine the patient, make sure the discharge summaries, everything else are in place, and then the physician comes in the room, examines the patient, provides oversight, and makes sure that, that everything is done. I think that going forward, especially as patients become, uh, you know, more and more chronic conditions and patients are sicker, to really have a team care approach is absolutely the right way to deliver care. Now, with that being said, I think the right way to do it is really work in a team, so where the physician is mentoring the extenders as well, not just that the extenders are working separately in the office and the physicians are working separately, I don't think you gain a lot of efficiency there because I think that everybody needs to work to the top of their license. So the extender may be seeing some of the, 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 the very um, low acuity issues like a cough or a cold, but then having the physician available for any of the, the high acute issues that, that would be there as well. Thank you. Um, one of our caller or our attendees is asking about the um, the ACO contracts that that PrimeMed is involved in and how you manage the the um, the different quality metrics that might be associated with each one. So uh, that again goes back to you know having the the data analytics software in the, in the data analytics um, staff because the the question is absolutely correct that. Just because you have certain metrics with CMS does not necessarily mean that, that on the commercial side, when you talk to um, different payers, they're going to want the same metrics. So you literally have to have the staff and then the software that can then support that. And uh, and on that one, the staff is even more important than the software because you know the software usually can can work with any different types of metrics that you try to get out of there. But if you don't have the right person who can analyze the software. And, and, and be able to produce the reports that you need to be able to you know, get you the results in a meaningful way, you're not going to be able to meet the needs for, you know, for the different types of pairs for those reports. Okay. Another question about physicians um, as, uh, as care team leaders. How, you know, what, um, how have you educated your providers and your care teams on, on population health and how um, has that made an impact? 
So you know, one of the things that uh, that's been helpful, as I mentioned earlier, is that our you know, even though ACOs and, and, and population health has, has become a bit of a buzzword of the last couple of years, something that, that we've, you know, pursued in our group probably for the better part of, of a decade. So the folks who already knew that, listen, we should always be providing high quality care and, and, and in, in a cost efficient manner. Um, for us, I got to tell you, that from that standpoint, the culture changed a little bit. It's been easier over the past couple of years because now we've said, hey, listen, before we said we need to do this because this, right, this is the right thing to do. Now, uh, these are the metrics that we have to meet. So it's been a little bit easier. I think that for groups that have not done this in the past, the best way to, to do it is really communicate a lot and communicate very, very often. What that means is you need to have team meetings. You need to have group meetings. You'll get a lot of resistance in the beginning, but I think you have to keep sticking with, with the message. And then also showing now it's a little bit easier to convince folks that they see what's happening around the country. And then I think finally, if you're able to tie some uh, the compensation incentives around that, that does help align incentives as well. Okay, we have time for just um, one or two more questions. Um, so uh, one question came in too about um, patient engagement. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the, um, the, the reaction of patients to receiving the, um, the calls to come in for follow-up visits? So I remember uh, is, uh, on the last question I was answering that, boy, you know, folks are going to be resistant to change. So when we first started using um, the, you know, the FITA outreach, of course, people were concerned that, you know, are they going to, how are they going to feel about an automated call, an automated call from the doctor's office. And again, you know, it took a while. It took us a few meetings to kind of get, get, get everybody on board understanding the logic. And then once they realized that, the patients actually like it because what will happen is you're going to find the patient is going to come in and say, Doc, I am so glad that your office called me because I didn't realize I hadn't been here in a year or I hadn't been here in, in two years for physical. So the patients are actually very, very thankful. Of course, you're going to have you know a couple that may not be happy with it, but I think that it, we have to remember what the greater good is. And if, if the greater good is to improve the population health and, and except for a couple of outliers who, for whatever reason, may not be happy with the call, the, the, the vast, vast majority do not mind it. In, in fact, now they've gotten so used to getting our calls that if, if some, for, for whatever reason, if somebody falls out of our practice management system and didn't get a call, they'll actually ask us, how come you guys didn't call me? So believe me, the, the, there is no real backlash at all. I know, I know some physicians sometimes were concerned about that, but, but that, that concern is, is, is definitely not, uh, nothing to worry about. Thank you. And um, the last question is, about team-based care and care coordination. How do you support patients with, um, with comorbidities, uh, including, um, or for example, depression and diabetes? How do you use other members of the care team, like social workers or nurses or health coaches, to support these patients? So um, you know what happens is that, so let's say if you look at somebody who may, who may have the, the comorbidity of, of diabetes, CHF, um, you know, what we do is, a, we have lists that, that have high-touch patients, means that patients who are at high risk, that if, if they don't follow through with, with a lot of, of, of their appointments or, or care appropriately, are the ones that, that are likely to get ill and either end up in the ER or just you know, get home and be sick. So we, we kept a separate list. We, we, we try as much as we can to make sure those folks are keeping up with their appointments, whether it's with, with the physician, whether it's with the CHF nurse, the, the, um, you know, the, 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 their dietitian. But, but you really have to make a concerted effort and, and, and have somebody who has got these folks on the radar and making sure that they're showing up to, to literally all their appointments, not only just the physician ones, but really the other, other team members as well. Because the physician, you know, all of us, you remember, is that really just to make sure they're doing okay and the medications are fine. But with the, with the, with the diabetes I was mentioning earlier, if they don't get in to see the nutritionist with the, with the CHF, if they're not, if the fluids are not being monitored carefully by the CHF nurse, then um, you know, again, that 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 may be a lost opportunity to keep that patient well. Well, thank you very very much. That um, will end our question and answer session. And want to remind everybody uh, that a copy of the presentation and the recording will be sent to you for participating in this webinar. And thank you once again, Dr. Rastogi, for a wonderful presentation. We got lots of positive comments uh, during the session. Great, great. Well, thanks very much for their attention, everybody.